Welcome to St. Paul's Bible Study on Revelation. This is chapter 4, and I am your host, I am your teacher, whatever you want to call this, um, Josh Laborius. I'm the vicar here at St. Paul. And without further ado, we are going to step right into Revelation. So how I want to start this chapter, how I start most chapters, is to kind of remember where we're coming from. So in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, we kind of see an introduction to the book. And we see letters written to the churches. And if you want to catch up on those letters, by all means, uh, go back and watch those videos. They're all here on YouTube. And then last week, we released a video called uh, something along the lines of a summary of the letters of Revelation or something like that. And it kind of goes through and it compares all those letters. And that's, that's all what we're stepping from. Is kind of a background. It's an address to seven churches that as we walk through those letters, we realize that most of them can apply to us too, even though we're not living in the church of Ephesus or the church of Pergamum or whatever. So that's where we're coming from. And with that, we're stepping into Revelation 4, which is a bit of a shift in topic, you see, because here in Revelation 4, we have what is called the inaugural vision of heaven. Throughout Revelation, there, there are four extended views of heaven, and, and there are more mentions of it uh, throughout the scriptures. Like, that's just the reality. They talk about heaven. I mean, it's kind of important. Um, but in a lot of cases, the, an, indi an individual sees it. So someone will say, I saw the heavens or I saw heaven, or I saw God seated on his throne. Um, but they don't necessarily describe it. They don't go into detail of this looked like this, and this was like this, and this person stood next to this person, etc., etc., etc. Or in other places, it's referenced really frequently, but there's no report of how it's seen. Um, and so what we're, what we're getting ready to see here, and what we see a couple other times in Revelation, is uh, if you were to compare maybe a letter... This, this being the letter, and in a letter, you can get some serious content. You can write out what you mean. You can be really descriptive versus maybe a postcard where maybe you get a picture and you get a couple lines, but you're, you're kind of limited in, in how much you're communicating versus just like checking in on social media where you just say, I was here. Um, so that's kind of the different ways we see heaven talked about, heaven referred to and addressed throughout the scriptures. Um, so before we get into the text itself, I want to talk a little bit just about how the New Testament handles heaven versus how the Old Testament handles heaven. You see, um, the Old Testament, when it talks about heaven, it, it doesn't include the saints. However, they're prominent in, in New Testament references. You see the saints all the time, um, which makes sense because before the coming of Jesus, that, that wouldn't have made as much sense um, as far as how much of God had been revealed to us. And then if, if you look at some other texts, uh, the Son of God is not explicitly mentioned. Now, we, we see the Son of God, we see Jesus Christ throughout the Old Testament, and you're saying, that doesn't sound right. Jesus was born at the beginning of the New Testament. What's up with that? He, he takes this form called the, the pre-incarnate Christ, is the theological word for it. And this is Jesus Christ before he's born because he w was still God. He is still God, but he hadn't taken on human form yet. And if you want, if you want the in-depth view of that, then I would encourage you, there's going to be a, uh, a little thing at the top of this video right about now. Um, that would encourage you to go check out Pastor Andrew's Bible study series, uh, lesson series on foundations in faith. And he addresses the Son of God and kind of what that looks like. Um, but he, he's not mentioned as explicitly, but in the new in, in Revelation, we see him elevated with the Father. And, and that's pretty consistent because the Old Testament focuses on the Father because Israel's relationship is primarily through their covenant with the Father. And in the New Testament, it, it centers on the Son because the new covenant is through Jesus Christ. So this makes a lot of sense. 
Um, but a, as you look at Old Testament versus New Testament, visions of heaven, that's kind of the distinction we see. So without further ado, we're going to hop into the text. I would encourage you get your Bibles out or uh, navigate yourself to a Bible app. Um, just I've had a couple of people ask me about this. So if you'll see on my phone, let me see if I can get this lined up with the camera, this app right here. It's really simple. It's called Bible. And when you open it up, it, it looks like it, it looks like this. And it's it's phenomenally easy to get to different passages. So plug for that. Um, I'm not compensated in any way for that, but uh, that is the Bible app that I use. So Get to your get to your Bible text. We're in Revelation four, and we're going to just start at the at the first two verses. It says, "After this, I looked, and behold, a door was standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, 'Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this.' At once I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. So." What we see here is we see this door standing open in heaven. And it's incredible because it's it's communicating that John is being given this special grace, this special gift to look into heaven. And this kind of matches, if you look into Jewish theology, it envisions a solid-like firmament, a, a door separating earth and heaven. So that's pretty consistent with with the the Jewish theology and and views of of kind of the separation between earth and heaven and we hear this first voice this is the exalted son of man this is Jesus Christ speaking to John and saying like here's what's going on here's what's going to happen um this is a mediator of God's heavenly glory and he invites him he says come up here I'll show you what must take place. He's invited to enter into heaven. And as we continue to walk further and further into his visions and into all the things he sees and is told, it's really cool that it's all at the invitation of God. Um, and it says that once he was in the spirit, and this is really important um, because what this communicates to us is that he is incapable of, of entering heaven on his own. Even though he's invited, he, he can't just walk in. He's in the spirit. He's brought in the spirit. Which makes sense because none of us are brought into faith, which brings us into heaven without the spirit. So, um, and my, my dad does this helpful illustration that might be less helpful here. Um, but the trick is you get someone in the class. I would ask one of you for, to volunteer and I'd say, lay down on the ground. And uh, then I would say, get up. And, and they'd start to get up because, you know, I haven't been very clear in my instructions. And I say, no, you're dead. You can't move. And, and so I reach out my hand and I say, get up. And, and they go to reach my hand thinking maybe the lesson's over or something like that. And I say, no, you, you can't reach out to my hand. You're dead. You can't move. And then finally, and this is, you tend to pick a smaller person in the class. Um, I just pick them up and put them on their feet. And it, it obviously has its failings and it falls short in different places. Um, but what it communicates here is you're, we're dead in our sin, in our trespasses. We can't do anything, especially not enter heaven and look at visions, but when the Spirit does it for us, when the Spirit lifts us up off the ground through no effort of our own, gives us faith, stuff like this is possible. So, um, And what this frames our entire conversation as is the Holy Spirit is... Uh, it's giving us this sense of something above and beyond the realm of human experience. So as this frames the rest of this chapter, we think this isn't just some ordinary thing that he's seen. He's seen something extraordinary. Um, it's very similar. If you look in the 2 Corinthians 12, we see Paul being snatched up as he's 
experiencing these different things. Um, but with that, we're going to move further. We're going to look at the next eight verses of Revelation 4, starting in verse 3. It says, And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the twenty-four on the thrones were twenty-four elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And the throne before the throne before the throne, sorry, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in the front and behind. The first, first living creature, like a lion, the second like an ox, the third with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So, that is the end of the chapter, so we're going to kind of step through, uh, there's a lot of symbolism here, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot going on here. But before I go forward, I want to um, provide a disclaimer, I guess, to my approach to Revelation. Because when you talk about Revelation... You, there, there are two like really far extremes. There are people on one side that take everything hyper literally. So later when we talk about the dragon, they think there's a literal dragon. They think all the measurements of time are very literal. They think everything can only be taken at face value. So that's kind of one extreme. And then on another extreme, there are people who say, well, this is all just a metaphor. John was sitting on the island, and he was never taken up into heaven. He never saw anything. Uh, it's all a metaphor for various things. And I'm squarely in the middle of that, because some of these things, I think, are literal. And the best interpretation of them is that they are literal. Uh, for example, I, I do believe that John was in the spirit, and he was taken up to heaven, whatever that looks like, um, to see these things. But on the other hand, I think there is a great deal of metaphor in Revelation. So I think some things are best interpreted that way. And the reality to this is I'm not going to declare which is which. I'm going to look at it at face value, say, well, maybe here are some interpretations for this. Here are what I think are likely interpretations for this. But frankly, God can do however he wants. If he wants to live, if he wants the book of Revelation to play out very literally, he is God and he can do that. If he wants four literal horsemen to come and be part of the end of the world riding out of the sky, you know what? That is his prerogative. Um, so with that disclaimer, let's go into this imagery of heaven. So, uh, first, we have this mention of Jasper and Carnelian. Um, so, what we're seeing here is this is the closest description John is capable to the glory of God. So, he's trying to distill the infinite glory of God into something that people can connect to and relate to. Um, as far as these stones specifically, uh, th these are both semi-precious or precious stones. I don't actually know the difference. I'm not a jeweler. You know how much I, I'm not going to tell you how much I paid for my wedding ring, but it wasn't a lot um, because I don't care. Anyway, um, send me forward. What, what is kind of interesting about these two stones is they're both part of the, uh, the clothing, the garments of the high priests in the Old Testament. So there is that connection, um, but they're precious stones. And then it goes forward and it talks about uh, the throne was around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of emerald. Um, 
this is a really significant reference because where does the rainbow come from? It comes from Noah and the flood, and it's part of God's promise for salvation for his people. So when John brings up this rainbow, he's reminding us of the saving mercy of God and his promise of mercy and grace. Um, and the emerald with Jasper and Carnelian, they made up the high priest's breastplate, as I mentioned a, uh, a minute ago. Um, so stepping forward, we have these 24 thrones and there are 24 elders on them. Um, there are a, a couple different interpretations of who these 24 are. Uh, I think the most fair understanding of who the 24 elders are, we have 12 tribes of Israel and 12 disciples. Alternatively, some people say these are just 24 exalted angels, but the reality is uh, the interpretation of 12 tribes of Israel and 12 disciples, that represents all of God's people. The 12 tribes of Israel being representative of, um, of God's ancient people, the Israelites, God's chosen people. And then the 12 disciples representing the New Testament church and everyone who is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, Another alternative connection, some people have connected this to the 24 priestly orders that were established during David's reign in the Old Testament. Um, and an important clarifying thing here, elder is used to describe a human everywhere else. Angels are never called elders. They don't sit on thrones. They are servants. And they don't wear crowns. So when people say, oh, it's probably 24 exalted angels, probably not because this language is never used to describe angels. Um, but it says that they're clothed in white garments with these golden crowns on their heads. These are, are reflective of wedding garments, which Jesus use, uses to talk about heaven very frequently. And they've been washed in the blood of the lamb. Um, golden crowns on their head, obviously, uh, put them in a place of victory. As we'll talk about over and over again, the connotation of crown in the Old Testament probably was more of victory. To the victor goes the crown rather than uh, royalty as much. There might have been still a little bit of that connotation there, but I, I it frequently would be they, they conquered, they were victors rather than they were kings. Um, so stepping forward, from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Uh, this highlights God's creative power, and it, it highlights his abilities within creation and, and just the magnitude of his glory. And then it talks about the seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. This is another reference to the Holy Spirit. It, it goes back to Moses' tabernacle that had seven lamps. Um, and then Zechariah 4, we see seven lamps as reminders of the active spirit of Yahweh, the active spirit of God in his people. So we're going to see that again and again. Um, and then before the throne was a sea of glass like a crystal. Uh, this, this ocean is completely calm. It is free of the Leviathan. It is free of the disruption of sin. But what it, it communicates here is that there's still a vast distance between John and God. We still have a long way to go. And, and it gets into this idea theologically that we talk about called the now and not yet. We are saved, but we're still waiting for the second coming. It's this idea of like Christ's work is finished, but he's still coming back again. And to be very frank with you, it is a paradox. God does that occasionally because God is God and we can't understand what's going on. But this is an example of now and not yet in that John is now in heaven, but he's not reunited with God yet because there's still this sea in between them. Um there's a suggestion of it being kind of a celestial sea. So the final thing we're, we're kind of going to talk about here is these four living creatures, which it spends kind of the rest of this, of this text discussing. Um, it doesn't identify them as angels, as cherubim or seraphim. Um, they're very reflective. They're very similar to beings that are described in both Isaiah and Ezekiel. And in, in those texts, if you go back to Isaiah and Ezekiel, they're called seraphim and cherubim, respectively. 
they move together with God on his throne. You see, they're in God's immediate vicinity, and we see that God here. And in every account of these four living creatures, they attend God. In fact, one is actually sent to guard the Garden of Eden. Uh, so if you look, some Jewish literature recognizes them as kind of the highest order of angels, as, as kind of a choir master or something like that. Um, so we can't say a lot for certain, but what I think is, is fairly apparent, what we can say for with a fair amount of certainty, is that the four living creatures are four of God's highest servants, and they do his will. Um, and they're blessed to be close to him and in his presence. So I, I don't want to get too bogged down in that because I think if we needed more details, the Bible would give us more details. We don't need to kind of fill it in with our own ideas. Um, but there is a lot of potential symbolism to the four living creatures. You have um, this suggestion of the four Gospels. And, and different authors align each living creature differently with the four different Gospels. Um, so you have four different aspects of humanity or of God that are then covered that then go on to highlight the different Gospels. Um, and, and another suggestion is that these four represent the totality of God's animate creation. You have the lion which would be wild creatures. You have the ox, which would be domesticated creatures. You have the, the third creature with the face of a man, which would be humanity. And then the fourth, you have an eagle in flight. So you have birds. Um, and that kind of encompasses the totality of God's animate creation. Um, all of that to be said, there, there are a lot of different ways you could symbolically take these to represent but none of those deny the existence of these angels in their own right. And I think the best way to take this is that, yeah, these angels exist. God has these four highest servants, but they're also representative of all creation and of a creation that serves God's will. Um, so that's how far we're going to get into the four living creatures now. And as we continue through Revelation, we're, we're probably going to circle back and talk about them more. Um, and the last thing that I, I want to bring up is this, this last couple verses. It says, the 24 elders, they fall down before him who is seated on the throne, before God, and worship him, and they cast down their crowns, recognizing that all authority is given to God. And, and there are people, and I think there, there's... They're taking it way out of context, but there are people that use Revelation to say that Christians should take authority, that they should, I guess, take over the world. But that's not our place. Even here, the, the elders who have been given crowns are casting them before God, saying that he is worthy to receive all glory and honor and power. Um, so, and, and that's, again, that brings us back to what Revelation is going to do and does consistently, and that is to bring glory to God and to keep Jesus Christ at the center, because that is what Revelation is about. It is about the fulfillment of the covenant of Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of God's plan for his creation and his people. Um, so that, that is the message I'm going to leave you on. And, and the question that I want you to ponder is, is how can you cast your crown before God? How can you give your glory and your honor and your power, which is a gift from God anyway, how can you cast that before his throne this week? All right, guys. Um, so that is Revelation 4. As always, uh, thank you for joining us. If, if you're curious about Revelation, we have this whole playlist that you can, you, that you can scroll through and, and watch more of if you go to St. Paul's YouTube page. Um, it's one of the playlists. It, it is on our homepage. If you want to get other content from St. Paul, I would encourage you to go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Subscribe to St. Paul Lutheran Church and School for all the Bible studies and devotions and live broadcasts and special programming and everything else. It's very exciting. Um, and if this video was helpful for you, go ahead and give it a like and boost my ego because that's what I need. Um, so that's where we're going to end. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.